So uh, I said, welcome to this this virtual tutorial. So I'm going to give a talk on making compilation. Hopefully, what you got from the um, from the, the bulletin I sent around was that one of the major um, aims of this um, session is to demystify Make. So this is very much a user's view of Make. Uh, that, that's my view of Make uh, from a user side and what I've learned over the years. Um, so if there's anyone there who, who has maybe more technical information than me, they're welcome to, um, if to butt in. Please do it via um, um, via a chat window. I do have a, what the reason I was a slight delay was I wanted to make sure I had a, a chat window open so that I could um, um, could see um, so I could see what people were saying. I don't seem to have any. Do people have video? Can people see my uh, my picture? Again, I'm having a slightly strange setup here. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Right. Okay. So I'll get going. So this all this um, material is under a Creative Commons license. So where Make um, comes in, I think I'm going to start fairly basic, but I think there are some points which are worth um, clarifying here. Is that you know compiling a simple code may be easy. You just cc program.c, which will produce a dot out, or you cc minus o program.exe program.c. That's kind of what we do when we first learn to, to program. But even only the simplest programs have one file. We typically have more than one source file. So what you could do is just do cc minus o program.exe and list all the files. But this is wasteful because you're recompiling everything independently. And so the solution that's standard in compiled languages like C4, Trans C++ is that you compile independently. So you do cc minus c, and that says I'm just compiling this, this program standalone. It doesn't have a main. You wouldn't actually be able to attend it into executable. And then we do that all independently. Then we link the object file, cc minus o program.exe, file 1.0, file 2.0, file 3.0. So this standalone compilation, cc minus c, produces an object file, a .o file, which we then um, link together later on. And that's fairly standard. But, there are, but these are the problems. What happens if I change file 2.c? I have to say, right, I've got file 1.c, file 2.3, file 3.c. I changed file 2.c. I've got to recompile it and then relink. This is an error prone procedure for two reasons. One is you might um, have changed more than file 2.c. You might forget to recompile it. And secondly, even that, that, that last line, cc minus o you've got to remember all the files to link. So then what people do is, well, I'll just be safe. I'll remove everything. I'll recompile everything by hand, and I might script this up. They might put this in a script and then link them. Well, that's wasteful because you only changed one file. You only changed file 2.c. So um, why should you have to recompile everything? And so this is where make comes in. Um, OK, so even more problems, sorry. Source files often depend on other files, such as include files. So you could have you could, changing one file could have multiple um, can have multiple ramifications. So I might have a file called include 3.h, which might be included by um, file 3.c. If I edit include 3.h, I need to remember, ah, OK, file 3.c included um, include 3.h, so I need to, to recompile just file 3.h. But maybe file 1.h includes include 3. File 1.c includes include 3.h as well. So the problem is that A, recompiling all files is slow and unnecessary. Uh, but B, failing to recompile a file is disastrous. If you get into a state where you forget to, to compile a file, what you have is you have an executable which doesn't reflect the source code in your source files, and that's a disastrous. It's impossible to debug because you look at the code and you think it's doing one thing, but you're actually linking in an old .o file which refers to a previous version of the code. So what we need is a tool which does uh, three things. It remembers the dependencies between files. It knows that file 3.c includes include 3.h. And we'd like it in a human readable form, because that information is not only useful to the compiler, it's useful to us. It's useful to know which files contain other files in a summary form, rather than having to, 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 to trawl through a whole, lots, a whole lot of code. We want the tool to recompile all the files that need to be updated whenever we make a change. But um, just as importantly, we wanted to only recompile the minimum number of files. And this is where make comes in. And so I think make, um, make has um, 
a fundamental, really does only a couple of things fundamentally. It can be used to build very complicated um, code building systems. But the user specifies pairwise dependencies between files. So it's just pairwise. So the terminology that make uses is depend. So you would say that program 2.0 depends on program 2.c. In other words, if program 2.c changes, then program 2.0 needs to be recreated. Or program 2.c uh, depends on include 3.h. So what you do is you specify pairwise dependencies between files. But of course, file A may depend on file B, but file B depends on file C and D, and file D depends on file E. Well, make works out the dependency tree. So you only specify pairwise dependencies, and make will unravel it all. You secondly specify pairwise rules for resolving dependencies. So you said that program 2.0 depends on program 2.c. So if you change program 2.c, you need to re um, you need to recreate program 2.0, but we haven't said how to do it. You also have to tell make, right, to update program 2.0, you run the compiler on program 2.c. So those are the two fundamental stages. You specify pairwise dependencies between files, which files depend on other ones. And for each pairwise dependency, you specify um, a, an update rule, a way for resolving that dependency. Say, well, if this file needs to be updated, then you need to do this. And typically in compilation, it, when you're compiling a large application, that, that will, be, um, will be compilation. But, but we'll see that it's more general than that. And all this information is stored in a make file. So the make file tells make, which is a program, how to update the files. It describes your, your entire software tree. So it tells make how to update the files, but how does make know when to update the files? So this is the third component of make. It looks at the date stamps. So this is fundamentally make just looks at the dates of files and says, if program 2.0 is more recent than program 2.c, then there's a problem. Because I know that it depends on program 2.0. Sorry, if program 2.0 program is older than program 2.c, if program 2.c is more recent than program 2.0, then there's a problem. We need to recreate it. So, so, so again, make, the make file specifies pairwise dependencies and pairwise rules for resolving those dependencies. And make decides when and if to apply those rules by looking at date stamps. So because make is a general tool, um, I'm actually going to try and um, uh, do an example which doesn't involve compilation. Because most people come across make straight, straight away for compiling big, complicated applications. And I think it's maybe try to take a step back and, and, and have a sort of a, a toy example to show how things work. So, there are three types of file I'm going to have. There's, I'm going to do a sort of family tree example. There's self, parent, and child. So there's david.self, which is me. David.parent is my parent. And david.child is my, my children, or our child. And the dependencies are that obviously yourself is younger than the parent, and the child is younger than yourself. And also to make things a bit so, so this is a bit like the way that .c and .o files are, are related. That we have, you know, that you know, if you if you update um, update the parent, then the child needs to be updated, and so does yourself. If we update the .c, the .o needs to be needs to be updated. We're also going to have one final output file, which is a bit like our executable. We link lots of things together. It's going to be called David Family. It's a date ordered listing of the source files. So if correct, the order should be parent, self, child. So what's the update rule? Well, the update rule, this is asexual reproduction. We're just going to copy. So, so if I want to produce a child, I just copy myself, copy david.self. I clone myself into david.child. And my parent is cloned to me. We would, to update david.self from david.parent, we would copy david.self to david.child. So what I'm going to now switch into a mode where hopefully I am going to be able to, um, um, I'm going to have to do one quick thing now, which is I'm going to have to find, I, so I'm, again, I'm in an unfamiliar setup. So um, apologies if there's a bit of a delay here. I need to get the source code again. Um, so I'm going to just grab that source file, which, um, which I put on the web. Okay, I'm not succeeding with that. Virtual maker, training virtual, okay. Good. So 
in it. Okay, so I should now be able to do this, so I'll get back to sharing the application. So in a second, you should, oops, um, you should see a putty window. Okay, so there's a putty window there. So what I've done is I've just down downloaded the um, the same tar file. Um, so okay, why did you see you're having some problems? Sorry about that. Um, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, this this session will be recorded though and available on the website as a available on YouTube as a video. Um, maybe within a few days of the session. So if you can't attend now, apologies for that. We will be able to follow it as a recording um, later on. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to unpack that. OK. And I'm going to go to this family one example. Um, family one. Um, Okay, what did I do wrong there? I just did a tape, did an extract. It's real family one. So we'll look at the we, we'll look at the the make farm to start with. So um, we'll see that this has very very simple rules in it. It says that David dot child depends on David dot self. So dependencies in make are specified with a colon. So that says that David dot child depends on David dot self. And then the next line is the rule saying that if this isn't satisfied, what do I do? And I said it's asexual reproduction, so I copy the self to the child. I also have to say that David dot self depends on David dot parent because I have to be younger. I produce from my parent, and if the parent if I am, uh, if my parent is, uh, sorry, if I am appear to be older than my parent, I need to recreate myself. So I need to copy David dot parent to David dot self. So this is the way. These are the these are the dependencies: child, self, self, parent, and these are the the the, the rules for, for resolving those dependencies. Okay. And um, David dot family. Uh, the David family depends on David dot self, David dot child, and David dot parent. And the way I'm producing these is I'm doing I'm I'm just listing all I, what I'm doing is I'm doing a date order listing LS myself David dot start out to David dot family. So let's just if we do if we look at the um at the, uh, the the listing you'll see that in the date ordered listing that I've listed them it's got parent child self and that's the wrong way around it should be parent self child. So if I type make David dot child it's noticed that it's out of date and it's done a copy. Okay, it's copied David dot self to David dot child. Okay, so um, so so that that has worked. Okay, it's noticed that David dot child is out of David dot self is out of date with respect to David dot child and supplied the res resolution rule copy David dot self to David dot child. If I do make the same thing again, I do make David dot child again. You'll see that it notices it's up to date. So not only does it do the update when it's necessary, it also notices when it's not not required. Okay. So the other thing I might want to do is if I now um, if I do make David family, you'll see there isn't a David family there. So when I do make David family, it notices it's out of date. It's out of date because it doesn't actually exist, and it produces them. It does ls malt lrt david dot star to david family, and if I look at david family. We see that um, that, uh, that that that's that that's correct. Parent, self, child in the right order. So that looks quite pretty simple. Um, doesn't seem to have gained us a lot. But what is worth doing is if I if I edit um, the uh, David dot parent, all I'm doing is editing it and just adding a space and saving again to make it more up to date. So if you look at the if you look at the make file, I haven't specified. I'm sorry, but the, I have um, annoying syntax highlighting. I haven't specified a, a dependency between the child and the parent. Okay, but there's an implicit one there because the child depends on myself, and myself depends on my parent. And make notices that 
if I do make david.child now, it spots that to update child, it needs to update myself, but, uh, but to update myself, it needs to update the parent. And so this is showing you that make um, unwind these pairwise dependencies, okay? So in fact, uh, similarly, if I do make David family, it has to recreate it. If I do it again, it says it not need to be done. So the, 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 the final thing is if I, if I update david.parent again, dot .parent, just put a space in and save it again. Um, if, I do, if, I do, if I do this and look at the listing now, you'll see that the parent is the youngest of all the files, which is clearly wrong. If I do make David, dot child, uh, make David family now, it does the whole caboodle. It notices, OK, the family depends on all these files, parent, self, and child. But child is out of date with respect to self, and self is out of date with respect to parent. So it unwinds the whole chain and does everything that's necessary to create family correctly. So if I look at the make file again, and again, I'm having to turn off, I should do this. You'll see that um, all I've done is specify pairwise dependencies and update rules, um, or dependencies between David family. This is a shorthand for saying David family depends on David self. I could do this in three separate lines. It's nice to do it as a single one. And then um, that's the update rule. So that's, that's, that's quite, quite useful. So hopefully, you, so, so I think it's useful to specify a, uh, an example. Look at an example which wasn't production of code to show you that Make is really just a general tool. It doesn't really know anything about compilation. All it knows is to look at dates, resolve dependent, and how to spot depend, spot conflicts in the dates, and resolve those dependencies. And eventually, it's most often used for um, uh, compilation, but it's not. It's not. Um, um, restricted to that. So if I now go back to the, um, the presentation, um, I'm now going to have another uh, example called Family 2. Now you've seen that, um, uh, that my rules are very explicit. Ah, Mark, does, Mark is saying, does the order in the make file matter? Well, um, <laughs> In terms of dependencies, no. In terms of dependencies, you can you can specify the dependencies in any order, and presumably internally make produces an entire tree structure. However, um, there is something in which there, there's one really one place where the order in the make file matters, and I'll come back to that in this example. So hopefully, I'll show you where that ma where that um, applies here. So um, it's imagine have another family called Sally. And we had Sally.parent, Sally.child, and Sally.self. I could specify all the rules all over again. And that would be like having lots of explicit rules in my make file. File 1.0 depends on file 1.c, cc minus c, file 1.c. File 2.0 depends on file 2.c, cc minus c, file 2.c. Now, I have seen make files written like this. But in fact, you know, although it automates the, the build process, it will resolve the dependencies correctly and only update the files that are needed. Writing this make file is incredibly tedious. You're replicating stuff. So rather than specify explicit rules all over again, it's nice to specify, to, to understand, to specify generic rules. So I'm going to, in the family example, rather than saying how to create david.child from david.self, I will say, given a self and a child, this is how you create the child from the self. And that rule will apply to david.child and, in this case, sally.child. So is it, what I've done is I'll now go back to that, that next example, the, the, the example. Um, the way I'm using it, it wouldn't stop particularly seamless transitioning between, um, I don't know if this, does this, does this help? No, that, in fact, that doesn't help, does it? Um, Uh, okay, that has now okay. That's fine. So what I'm going to do is I go to family two, and if you look in family two, you'll see that we have we have David and Sally, both of whom have parents themselves and their children. So let's look at the make file. And this is um, this has this illustrates quite a few more things, and I'll go through them um, 
in order. First of all, um, um, it's probably it's a nice thing to do to tell make. Oh, sorry. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to we're going to do rules that depend on the suffixes. So what we're going to say is this rule here, rather than saying David dot self, uh, David dot child depends on on David dot self. What we're saying here is generically dot self dot child says that child depends on self. So that's a generic rule, and this will turn out to apply to anything. So these are suffix rules. Dot self dot child says that any child depends on any self, and dot parent dot self says that any self depends on any parent. Because we're specifying suffixes, um, it's useful to tell make what suffixes we're going to use. So you don't normally need to do this because normally make knows about dot c dot f dot f ninety dot cc, but in this case it never heard of parent self and child. So that magic line dot suffixes dot parent dot self dot child says, look, I'm going to be concerned with suffixes of, of that type, and I'm going to tell you what the rules are. So so this syntax says um, that dot child depends on dot self. And then the next line is just the, the update rule. Clearly, we, we've not got a specific update rule. We can't say copy David dot, uh, self to David dot child. So this is where make becomes a bit cryptic, but there are, the, there are magic symbols. So the dollar left hand is the, um, is the, is the thing um, on the thing which exists, which in this case is self, it's on the left hand side, and dollar at is the target, the, th the thing that's being made. So this, th this says copy the thing on the left, the dot self, to the thing on the right, the dot child. It's not a particularly elegant syntax, but that's the way it is. So these mysterious symbols just mean, you know, here they mean the thing on the left and the thing on the right. And here again, dot parent dot self, it says when you see a dot self file, it depends on a dot parent. And if the date order is incorrect, then we copy the thing on the left, the parent, to, to the thing on the right, uh, the self. So these are now uh, generic rules which will apply to any, um, any file. I now, I'll come to this line later. David family now depends on David parent, David child, and David self. This is the same. I've just done a bit of a trick here. This is something I only found out the other day, actually. But um, again, the, the rule for creating families list the files in reverse date order. This output to dollar app means create the thing on the left, the thing which create the thing which is the target, and that's David. Oops, I didn't mean to edit that. That's David family. This magic dollar carrot I only found out the other day means everything on the right hand side. So it means David parent, David child, and David self. Okay. So again. Um, these are just little magic symbols which are useful to use. They're useful shorthands. And this means that when I have this sally.family, sally.parent, sally.child, sally.self, I can just use the same syntax there. List everything that's on the right-hand side and stick it into the thing on the left-hand side. This is where um, somebody asked about um, ordering. So here we have a standard rule. These are standard rules which A have dependencies, A depends on B, and B has a rule for resolution, the copy rule. So here, a dependency A depends on B and a resolution rule. You can have two other types of rule. One is where you don't have a dependency, and that means that make always executes this. So if I type make clean, make will all, there are no dependencies, so it always does the resolution rule. And this is a convention, this is just a convention in make files. You have a clean um, rule or a clean option which just removes all the nasty stuff. Here I'm removing the family and the David family, Sally family, and all these nasty twiddle files that Emacs insists on leaving around. Now somebody asked about what, if the order matters. The only sense in which the order really matters, if you type make without a target, you just type make, it will make the first thing that it comes across. So conventionally, the first rule we put in a make, uh, generic rules don't count here. It's only ex the explicit rules which matter here. Um, we have an all rule, and we say all depends on David family and Sally family. So make all is a synonym for make David family, make Sally family, but also make does the same thing because it, 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 it comes down the make file, and the first thing it, it, it sees is the all rule. So the order of the make file only matters in the sense that when you type make, it will make the first thing it comes across. So in fact, in the previous example, if I typed make, it would have made, it would have made David, dot, um, David dot child. So here, let's we can experiment. Um, I, I stupidly edited that, but if we just type make, everything was up to date in date order except um, these family files didn't exist. So it just applies that rule. But if I now edit, for example, sally.parent, 
and I do make, for example, Sally Family. Um, sorry, Sally Family, not Sally Family. Um, it will copy. It notices that everything's out of date because the parent is is at the root of the tree. If the parent is younger than everything else, you have to redo everything. So it copies the parent to self, self to child, and it does the listing. And although I had an explicit rule for that last thing, the dependencies of si dot parent and si dot self came from the generic rule that all parents produce themselves, all selves produce their children. There was no explicit rule there. Um, and so, um, I, uh, for example, if I, uh, I can do the same thing with David dot parent. If I type make, it will make everything, but it hopefully will notice that Sally family is up to date and only make David. And if I do make again, it says everything is up, is up to date. It says it's nothing to be done for all because it was the, the, the thing it was creating was all. Okay, that make nothing to be done for all. It says that because the first thing was all. You can still make sub. Uh, if I if I do Emacs um, the parent again, if you want to play around and see how make files work, you can still you can still make anything. Okay, so I can do make uh, for example David dot child, and I think this should copy the parent um, to the self and the self to the child and stop there. And that's what it does. So you can make anything, or I can do make uh, David dot parent, and presumably it will say it's up to date. There's nothing to be done for that. So um, you can make anything in there, be it specified with an explicit or, or, or a generic rule. But of course, the normal thing you would make would be something like David family, which would be the um, the the, 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 tar the main the final target, and everything's up to date for that except for creating it. So so I think. Oops. Hopefully, um, you'll see that the way this works is I specify the suffixes because I'm going to do generic rules. I need to say what suffixes are going to apply. You don't often need to do this because make knows implicitly about common files. You specify what the rules are, so what the dependencies are. Dot self dot child says that. Um, uh, actually, it's, it's, if you read to right to left here, dot child depends on dot self, and then this this rule, which is a pattern matching rule, says to resolve that you copy the thing on the left to the thing on the right. You copy the the, the origin to, to to the target. This all rule is a convention. The thing we most commonly want to make, we want to put at the start, and so as we don't have to write the make file in a specific order, we just have a, an extra all rule which we says, well, the, you know, the things I'm most interested in are David family and Sally family. That's one of these rules with a with a with a uh, dependency, but no resolution rule. So make says, well, he's told me to make David family and Sally family. He hasn't told me how to do it here, but presumably elsewhere in the file I can find those rules. These are standard rules with dependencies, although they depend on multiple files and, and a resolution rule. And this is the other rule where there is no dependency, so it's always oper it's always um, uh, done, and it's a house cleaning cart task. So if I do ls myself, you'll see I have lots of horrible um, twiddle files. If I do make clean, it removes them. I've, I haven't found that hash file, but there we are. So make clean is a standard way of um, of cleaning cleaning stuff up. So hopefully that's reasonably explicit. So I'll go back to the um, the presentation. So um, we saw how to use generic suffix rules. So having um, done those two generic examples, I'm now going to do um, a, an actual example that comes from a, a code that we we use in a in a course. Uh, it's just a little piece of C which does some image sharpening. But what this will illustrate is um, the use of variables. I haven't used var any variables yet. I've specified, um, but we'll see what I mean then. Dependencies on header files, um, global change of C compiler, and creation of one list of variables from other. They're very useful things to do. Some magic variables actually already covered them. The thing on the left hand side of the expression you're working on, this is this dollar less than and dollar. I've actually put them into the family two example, as I have done for um, for, for all and, and these, these dummy rules for, for, for clean. So in fact, I've covered those already. But what I'm going to show you is a more um, typical make file um, where you have uh, multiple source files, multiple object files, and possibly multiple header files. So. Um, I'll now go back to the C example. Uh, 
Okay, and go, it's called a C sharp. So what we see is a fairly standard um, set of files. We've got a make file, we've got a bunch of C files, CIO, do sharpen, filter, sharpen, utilities and, uh, and utilities. And we've got two header files, sharpen.h and utilities.h, and we have a make file. We also have an image file there, which is an input file, but that's not particularly important here. So let's look at the, the make file. I'll try and so first of all, this illustrates the use of variables in make. Um, I can have a, a generic variable called mf, which I call the make, which is the make file. The most useful one is here. I'm going to use this to specify what the C compiler is, cc equals cc. So later on, I will generically not refer to little cc, but I'll re refer to the variable big cc. And that means if I want to change the C compiler, I need to change it in one place, right at the top here. If I want to use a different C compiler, I change it in one place. And then I have some C flags, which are going to be passed to the C compiler, and L flags. These at this moment, these are just variables. Okay? X equals sharpen. Now you can guess that's because that's the executable. It's going to be called sharpen. But these are just variables at the moment. So the classic thing in make is what we do is we have a, a variable called source. Again, that's just convention, which lists all my source files. So what I've got here is source, and these are just continuation characters, just as they are in C, the backslash, just so I can put them on multiple lines. The source is all the source files, and the include is all the include files. And what I've done is I've tried to write this make file that, that for simple programs, you won't need to edit below this line. You will just be able to change the, the, the name of the C compiler, the name of your C flags, the compilation flags, the name of your link, your link flags, and um, and then just use this because I've tried to encapsulate everything in generic rules. So what I've done down here is, here we go. Dot suffixes. Dot suffixes. Dot c. Dot o. This is slightly overkill, but what I'm saying is. One of the problems with make is it has a huge number of, of inbuilt default rules, which I don't like. So dot suffixes says, look, forget everything you know, and I'm going to be dealing with dot c and dot o files. I'm going to tell you what to do with them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, for example, dot c dot o. This is just like the previous dependency. It's saying that dot o files depend on dot c files. What do we do to resolve that? We run the C compiler which I've parameterized as dollar cc with the c flags. Minus c is um, just, this is just independent compilation, just compile the dot c file to a dot o file. And this dollar left line is the, is the dot c file which it applies to. So this is just an extension of what we did in the family two example. It's just a generic rule, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying how do you generically create a dot o file from a dot c file. My first rule is, is the all rule, and that says that the thing I want to make is the executable, which here is called sharpen. The main rule is, what does the executable depend on? Well, the executable depends on the object files. The executable depends on the .o files. And to create an executable from the object files, I run the C compiler with the C flags. The O is the output of the compiler, which is at, which is the, the executable, which is there on the left. And I link the object files, and I also have the link flags. Um, so that's really quite simple. Um, and in fact, that would all work. I have another couple of rules here, such as object. But I won't. Um, ah, sorry. And I said the object files depends on the make file and the include files. Um, it's kind of obvious the object files depend on the include files. Um, if you change an include file, you need to recompile the, the C files, which include them. Now, in fact, this is, I am saying that if you change any of the include files, you need, to, you need to update all the object files. That's overkill, but it's all I can do in this generic template. You might, if you knew that um, you had a, that, that, that a certain include file was only included by a certain C file, you can have explicit rules here saying, you know, file 3.0 depends on file include 3.h. But I've just had a catch-all here, which is a bit of a, you know, I'm saying if you change any of the include files, then just recompile everything. Um, may not be, that may be overkill, but at least it's safe. And there's a dependency on the make file itself, which may seem a bit weird, but I'll come back to that. But I mean, if I just type make, it looks at the um, the first rule that comes across is the all rule. The all rule says you need to build the executable, which I've called sharpen. And so it just runs through everything. It does all the steps. It, it comp through, using those uh, generic rules, it knows to compile all the .c files individually. And then using that rule for producing the sharpened um, 
executable, it links all the .o files together and sticks in the libraries. So this is again, the fact this is doing compilation is purely because I have to find the, 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 the rules to be, you know, do compilation if I parameterized it. So let's see, for example, if I um, update one of my, my files, sharpen.c, which is added in a space, and type make again, it, it spots that the only file that has changed is sharpen.c, so I need to recompile that file. All the other .o files are up to date, it relinks them all. But of course, if I change a .8 file, I've told it that all the object files depend on the .h file, so if I change any .h file, I need to recompile. So this should recompile everything, which it does. Um, if I just remove the executable and type make again, it will notice that all it needs to do is relink. And so this is standard thing in make um, that you can, if another thing, for example, again, I can, um, I can do a make clean, which cleans everything up, just removes everything. And again, just like any make file, I don't have to make the default target. I could do make, um, I could just do make sharpen.o, and that works. Uh, compile sharpen.c. If I just type make, it will do everything except it spots. It doesn't need to recompile sharpen.c. It just compiles the other files. So um, this is, um, I hope, useful. I think for, I mean, it's impossible to be completely generic, but for a large class of um, of simple C programs, you can use a make file like this um, to, uh, to to build you know, reasonably complicated applications. You may have wondered. Let's go back through. Have I explained everything? I should change off this. Um, I, there's a dependency. Oh, okay. So I didn't explain this rule. I've only defined a variable called source, which is on the .c files. I would like a variable called obj, which has all the object files, but I don't want to have to type it all out explicitly. Again, that would be wasteful and error prone. So there's, again, a rather strange, I'm not saying that the, C, that the make syntax is, is particularly elegant. There's a rather strange syntax, which says the object files is all the source files, but with .c replaced by .o. And one of the nice things you can do in make is you can just change all the rules. So for example, um, I could have a um, have a, a print obj rule, which just says, look, I, I want to check. If I want to check that I've done that correct, that's a bit of a bizarre syntax, this syntax here. Um, if I want to check I've done that correctly, I can just put in a rule that says, well, I have to do make print obj. These next line is executed in the shell. So you can actually put any shell commands in here. Um, and the thing I didn't say is uh, in, in variables in make are like shell variables, that when you define them, you say, say, x equals sharpen. When you reference them, you have to put a dollar sign in front. So for example, you have to say dollar of x. So when you reference a variable, you have to put a dollar in front of it so it knows a variable. But if I have a print object rule here, I can print out what those things are. So if I do make print object, print the objects, it, it will echo, and it's sharpen.o, do sharpen.o, filter.o, cio.o, and utilities.o. So again, make files, there's nothing to stop you playing around with make files, putting in, you know, if you don't understand how a make file works, you can put your own rules in there to print things out to try and understand what it's doing. And so this make file is very useful not only to make, but also to a programmer because it tells you immediately what the source files are, what the include files are, and what the dependencies are. Now here it's very simple, but it, it is a useful, um, it is a useful repository of the information on how to build um, um, how to build a program and in, in the simplest form make files are relatively human readable so um, I can actually if I do make clean and make I could just show you, I actually does this actually run yes it does run it does an image sharpening I'm not sure the answer, okay but it does actually run the the one thing I haven't explained yet is the dependency on the make file so um, you'll see that I've said that the object files depend on 
the include files will also depend on the make file. But what this is saying is if I change the make file itself, everything needs to be, all bets are off, we need to recompile from scratch. And the reason is I might decide that I don't want to use CC, I want to use GCC. Now I've updated the make file, I have some .o files, and the dates may be correct, but they're wrong because they were compiled with the old C file, or the old C compiler. Because I have a dependency of all the objects on the make file, if I do a listing, you'll see the make file is now more up to date, and when I type make, it will, I've shown two things here. The dependency of the object on the make files means it knows to recompile. And you, I've seen that by changing one variable in one line, I can switch between the, the, uh, the C compiler and GCC, which on the Cray are not the same thing. So this should still work. Um, it's actually running through a different compiler, but um, 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 it, it, it runs. So hopefully that was a useful example. I'll go back to the presentation. Um, so it illustrates variables and some these magic variables and some some ways of manipulating variables, how to put dependencies on header files, uh, the creation of one list of variables from another. I've shown you all that. So hopefully that was useful. And you, again, that, all that code is on the on the web, so you should be able to download it. There is a Fortran version. I don't have time to go through it. Fortran. I haven't used modules in this version uh, because modules are um, are a bit hard to cope with. Um, and also, there's also uh, for, for historical reasons, there's also a C file there as well as the Fortran. Hopefully, that shows you how you can have make files that cope with multiple languages at once. But I'm not going to cover that in detail, although it is there. Um, some dirty linen. Um, one of the biggest issues with make is that tabs have magic significance. So um, when I had what looked like a big blank space at the start, so I, ha I had a dependency rule and then what to do if that, if that dependency needs to be resolved underneath, you have to have a tab in front of that rule. It's a crazy syntax. I don't really understand why. So you can't cut and paste make files from the web because you get eight spaces, not a tab. Glue make does spot this. I, I, I did actually put some spaces in by hand. I do make David dot child. The make says missing separator. Did you mean tab instead of eight spaces? Well, given they can spot that I had eight spaces, not a tab, I don't know why it's bothered. There must be some subtlety in the, the syntax of make that means that you need some extra delimiter there. But um, this is the most annoying thing about make files is that if you email them to people or cut and paste from the web, they don't work because you replace the tabs with eight spaces and they look the same on the screen. So that is a nasty. I said I'm not pretending here that the syntax of make is particularly elegant, but I would like to, hopefully I'm showing that the, the philosophy is relatively simple and, and they are understandable. Um, a few tricks and tips. I've shown you can make anything under control of make. So you can make individual files, make file.o. And make minus m prints out what make would do without doing it. That's useful if you think, mm, I want to you know, I want to see what's going to happen here, but I don't want to actually do it. It's useful for debugging sometimes. Uh, make minus minus debug prints out why make is doing what it's doing. I've also shown you can you, you can print debug info in the update rule. So I've shown you that you can print stuff out. You know, if you didn't know, if you wanted to show you what if you didn't, if you you, had, if you weren't quite sure which rule was being executed, you put a little echo in there, so when it's executed, you get you get some um, you get some output to the screen. So to show you make minus n, and I'll maybe go back to the that app, the um, so if I, for example, um, uh, if I just Edit do sharpen dot c for example. I do make minus n. It actually says what it would do, but it doesn't actually do it. So it's just echoing. I would run the C compiler on do sharpen. I would then run GCC and link them together. It's not actually doing it. If I do make minus minus debug, it will tell me what it's doing. So there it says, um, okay, a bit of blurb at the start. It says file all does not exist. Ah, OK, fine. So it's saying I've come across a rule called all, but it's not a file. This is one of these dummy rules. Um, but it then says prerequisite do sharpen dot c is newer than target do sharpen dot o, must remake target do sharpen dot o. And then it says what it's doing is from the C compiler. And it's, it's, it's happy. 
prerequisite to sharpen.o is newer than target sharpen, must remake target sharpen, and it runs the, um, the, the, C, the GCC there to link them. Successfully remade, must remake target all, successfully remade target file all. So, I mean, it, there it shows you how it sort of unwraps all the dependencies from the bottom to the top. So, again, if your make file isn't working, make manage manage debug can be useful because you can see what it's missing or, or, um, or why it's not working. And make minus, as I said, prints out. Can you do? Um, I presume you can do minus n and minus debug together. So, just to finish off, as I'm slightly behind schedule because of the late start, um, various complications, Fortran modules. I don't want to go to the details, but Fortran is, is, is a more sophisticated language in, ter in, 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 in the way it, it works with interfile dependencies than C. So Fortran modules are a bit of an issue. Um, a Fortran module is like a C header file, but it's produced by the compiler. It's effectively like the compiler responsible for producing the header files. And that means that Fortran make files are a bit more complicated because if um, a program uses a module, the, that module has to be compiled before the program is compiled. So you, you have extra dependencies in Fortran files, uh, in Fortran make files to make sure things are, um, are updated in the right order. What well, if I have hundreds of header files? I don't can't be bothered going and looking at them all to see where they all appear. Well, there are some tools, make dependence one, which will write the rules for you. It will it will trawl through all your sources and say, ah, file 3.c depends on include 3.h. Often make files are actually produced by a, a higher level tool called GNU Auto Tools. So maybe I've seen people do uh, um, you know configure uh, make configure uh, make and make install. All that configure does is it writes a generic, it writes a make file. But unfortunately, these are not human understandable. They're very verbose because they're completely generic. So if you, I mean, I think it's useful to understand what's going on under the hood. But um, if you want to, if your do auto configure stuff isn't working, then you need to understand how they work. It, it's not that useful to understand make in that in that sense. Make has many implicit default rules. So, for example, it has a default way of creating a .o file from a .c file. I don't like that. I like to, I, if I've forgotten to define something, I'd like Make to say, you have not told me how to do this, rather than guess what to do. And so my Make files tend to be very explicit. Um, you know, with that dot suffixes colon, I think, has the effect of getting Make to forget all these default rules and, and only, only take notice of the, implicit, of the explicit and generic ones that you specify yourself. But I don't like these, I don't like relying on implicit default rules because things can go wrong. You can have an incorrect file, Make file, which happens to work, but maybe later on doesn't work. So, specific things on Archer. Um, on Archer, as you may remember, the C compiler is always called CC. The Fortran compiler is always called FTN. But depending on what compiler, what module you have loaded, that generic compiler um, can link to a different specific compiler. It might be the, the GNU compiler, the Cray compiler, the Intel compiler. And the GNU, Intel, and Cray compilers take different compile time options. So how can you have a generic make file which copes with all the compilers when you have to have different values of C flags? Well, within the make file, you can play some tricks. You can look at environment variables. And there's an environment, say, if the programming environment Cray is loaded, then the value of that is called loaded. So you can do things in the make file saying, you know, if this, if this if Cray progen Cray is loaded, then the C flags is this. If Cray progen GNU is loaded, then the C flags are that. If the Cray progen progen Intel is loaded, then the C flags are something else. So you can still cope with that. What you can't cope with is when you change the compiler. Change the compiler module is invisible to Make. So Make still thinks you're running the same compiler because it's called CC. So when you when you do a module switch, say progen create the progen Intel, you're going to have to do a make clean before you remake. There's no way that make can know that you've changed the compiler because according to make, it's still called CC, it's still called FTN. Um, there is a sort of a, a style of using make files where people always type make clean and make. That's wrong. The whole point about make is it's supposed to 
compile the minimum file set. So if you have a correct make file, you should never have to type make clean. You only type make clean when, when things have gone disastrously wrong, or you've made a change like this to the environment, which make cannot know about, and so you have to make clean. But you know, I see a lot of people, whenever they change a single file doing make clean make, you shouldn't have to do that. In general, compile. Um, edit, compile, run cycle, you should have to edit the files you need and then just type make and a correctly written make file will pick up all the correct um, dependencies and resolve them. So that's the end of the presentation. Sorry that went on slightly longer than I expected, but I'm happy to take any questions people have. I said my audio isn't working, I don't think, so you'll need to type them in. I will not probably repeat the questions for the sake of the recording, but please feel free to type in questions and I'll, I'll see if I can answer them. Can you use examples of how to use if steps inside a make file? That's a very good question. So, haha, I had hoped to have a make file which used the if statements correctly, but um, I, I was doing this yesterday. I realized I should have that. This is a new example I put in. And so I uh, started last night to extend the sharpened make file to do the ifs and couldn't quite get it to work. So uh, um, apologies. I will, my plan was to extend that. Th there is a syntax where you do if, you know, dollar variable equals this, then else, you know, phi. It's kind of shell type syntax. But I was, um, I was failing to, um, uh, to get it to work correctly. So what you would do is you would say, you know, if if the program environment is prog and cray, then C flag. But I said I was working on this last night and um, I couldn't quite get the syntax right. So I apologies that that is there. But what I will do is I will um, my plan was to when that's working, it's just a matter of speaking to somebody who I think there is actually an example on the um, Archer website. But I will put that into the C sharp and an F sharp and um, uh, so, so I'll just start. With I'll put that into that make file and, and put it up on the um, on the web. So in principle, it's simple. You just do if this, then that. But in practice, I, I had some slight issues. So apologies for that. I tend to compile my .f with the depend with the dependencies without making the interim dot. Is this bad prep? Well, so what's so. So what you're saying there is that um, I think the problem there is if you change anything, you'll recompile all the files. So it's not wrong, but it means that if you have 100 Fortran files and you change one of them, you are then going to recompile all 100 Fortran files to compute to to um, produce the executable. When in fact, you only need to recompile one. So um, that would be my understanding of what you're doing. It's, it's, it's not wrong, but it does mean that um, you're effectively, your make file is, is always picking up when it needs to recreate the executable, but it's not doing the make most efficient thing when it does. It is recompiling everything. And by using these intermediate .o files, you can actually get it to only recompile the, um, the files that it needs to do. Now, actually, <laughs> On Archer, linking is by far the slowest thing. That's atypical. Um, but um, is, is that my understanding of what you're doing, uh, is it Adam? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. I mean, you, you've got a conservative approach. Your make file is, is picking up when it, when things do need to be recompiled, but it's then being unnecessarily recompiling lots of files, which isn't wrong, but um, um, but now, as I said, with Fortran, that, that's probably a right thing to do in Fortran, because with Fortran, you, you may change a module, and then you need to recompile the files that use that module, but you need to recompile the module first before you recompile the files that use it. So in fact, in Fortran, it can be quite difficult to get that to work correctly. So um, it's a bit more playing around. So I appreciate that. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Can you also please go for some make file that handles .mod files? So actually, I I used to um, uh, do this 
with dependence on the dot mod file. The problem is, so, sorry, that's a fairly reasonable question. Um, the problem is that it's not standard in Fortran how module f modules are dealt with. So on some compilers, if it compiles fred.f90, sorry, if it compiles a module called fred, it will, it will produce a uh, module called fred.mod. The complexity is that there's no link between the source file name and the module. So you can have a, a, a file called fred.f90 that had a module called billy. billy and it would produce a module called billy.mod. So to get around that, I so I tend to do the dependencies on the .o file. So for example, if 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 program.f uses a module from module.f, I would say program. Okay, so one way is to put the .o files in the right order, but that's messy. So the right thing to do, what I've done before is, uh, I was just trying to put it into words there. If program.f uses a module from module.f, then the dependency is that program.o depends on module.o. So what it says is if module.f changes, it updates module.o from module.f and then recompiles program.o from program.f. So that, that's what I tend to do, is put in dependencies of, um, of so, so program.o depends on module.o, is saying that program.f includes a module which is defined in module.f. So um, I, again, that's a, that would be a useful extension. Um, I'd need to find a... Uh, but I, I, I do it through dependencies on the .o files, which I think is safe. Um, um, it's ha you can't do it generically because because um, you need to do it explicitly for your program. The reason it can't be done generically is, as I said, the name of the module and the name of the file on which it's defined are not related, and not necessarily related. So, um, and not all compilers produce .mod files. Yeah, percent O dot percent C. Yes, I think that's so. There is. This is more. I think what I do there is is a shorthand. Um, percent dot O percent dot C is saying that anything dot O depends on anything dot C. So I think what I've done is just a shorthand for this. So Make does have more sophisticated pattern matching, um, which is percents and dollars and all these kind of things. So yes, percent dot O depends on percent dot C. I am I think it's just a synonym for dot C dot O. But that syntax is in principle more um, uh, more generic. So I think you could say percent dot O depends on um, a more general expression. Um, I use the simple dot C dot O. Yeah, so again, you've seen that, that, that actually that's the other, yeah, so, so it's, slightly, it's slightly the other way around. So, so the syntax you should, you, you've shown there is the more obvious one. Something dot O depends on something dot C, whereas my syntax dot C dot O is sort of saying this is how you create a dot O from a dot C. It's kind of the other way around. Maybe percent dot O percent dot C is actually a more intuitive way of doing it. Uh, maybe I could actually, let's just, rather than, I've been exhorting people to, um, To do, to use trial and error. Let's rather than a dot c dot o. Let's do percent dot o colon percent dot c. Is that right? Ah, uh, no, mixed implicit and static pattern rules. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I left. I thought it needed the second column, but obviously not. Yep. Okay. So yeah. Uh, and if we rm filter dot o do make again. Yes. But I think um, that uh, you, this syntax is more generic because I think I could do something like percent dot o depends on 
thread percent dot c. So that would that that would say that Billy dot o depends on thread Billy dot c. It's a more generic, it's a more um, um, sophisticated pattern matching. So you can do more complicated things on the right hand on, on the on the right hand side. That's possibly I, I like. I have to say uh, that. That I think is a nicer way of saying it than dot c dot o. I may switch because it's it, it's the right way around. It's you know th this depends on that, whereas the other syntax is sort of slightly inverted. So I think actually that's that, that maybe as I said, I my knowledge of make just comes from um, from from usage over. Well, I, I shudder to say at least 25, if not 30 years, definitely 25 years. Anyway, so um and so you just tend to do what you what you know, but that is actually. I think I'll leave that in because that's actually a nicer syntax um, um, than I had. I mean, a colleague of mine, Stephen Booth, did write a generic tool for producing um, make files which unraveled the Fortran dependencies through modules, but um, Actually, maybe I didn't dig that out. It was quite difficult for him to make it completely generic because there were so many compilers and so many different things. Okay, um, a few people are leaving. I'm going to have to take a few final questions. I apologise for the slight audiovisual problems at the start, but uh, hopefully it was all legible and uh, and audible. Um, and I, I don't think it's particularly a loss that I can't hear you because in, in previous virtual tutorials people have always prepared to, preferred to use text, and it's. Um, it's maybe a better way of doing it. So, if there are any final questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, I looks like I have a couple of updates to do on the the examples, which is the if syntax and the um, and the example of how to cope with Fortran modules. That is a very that is a very important point, Fortran modules and. Uh, um, if you change, so yeah. Oh, uh, they are they are linked in from the same place where you joined. So if you go to slash training slash virtual, um, they're just there um, as a link. So the, the PDF slides are there, and the the tar file is there. Um, and when it's processed and um, and 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 and. and Cleaned up and whatever the video will appear from 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 that same page. That's right. The, the the version I was working with here, I just I just pulled straight from the uh, from the website. Okay, thanks everyone. That was useful. So um, I hope sorry. I hope it was useful. And um, there's the next. We plan the next tutorial will probably be about. Uh, um, bash tips and tricks. Um, ten, ten reasons why Bash is awesome. Um, Andy Turner, who's slated to give that, is is on leave at the moment. So we need to check the details when he comes back. But that's our current plan. If it changes, we'll update the website very very shortly. Thanks very much.